reading this morning is from Philippians 1, verses 1 to 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving and prayer. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. For the word of God. Thanks, Deb. Well, we, I think we do. Did me, <clears throat> or did you wake up today and go, oh my goodness, I, I can't believe we're at the end of the year. It's New Year's Eve. Isn't that crazy? And uh, where did the time go? Where did it go? Just like that. It's just boom, all gone, one whole year. And, and how strange is it to be in church on New Year's Eve? It doesn't happen all the time. It only comes around every now and then. Um, I don't know about you, but around this time of year, I get a little bit nostalgic. I start to think about the year gone by, and it's not just me. You turn on the television at the moment, and the news is talking about all the things that happened this year. It's never good, though, is it? It's always the bad stuff. But God's been doing good things, we know that. And even one of the, I like to read blogs on the internet and there's a Christian blog where they had all the Christian leaders in the churches that all died. How depressing, how depressing. All throughout 2023, the the leaders who died in the church, we know that they're not dead, they're alive with the Lord, right? You know, we can be so depressed sometimes, can't we? Um, But it is a moment this time to stop and reflect, to stop and reflect. And I think we do that, we we just naturally do it at the end of the year because the dates are going to change, 2023 to 24. Life is changing. Life is rolling on. Every year, my beard gets a little bit more grey, you know, and there's nothing you can do about that. You're changing, you're changing, everyone's changing and the world is changing. So we need to, sometimes we naturally go, I'm just going to stop and reflect and what is happening to me? What is happening to me? Do you ever wonder that? Or do you just walk along thinking, I'm, I'm fine, you know, I'm, anyway. So I think it's good to stop and think about why are we here? Why are you here? You know, I, I, I started off today, a lot of people weren't here, and I was thinking, well, people are somewhere else. But you don't have to be here New Year's Day. You could go and be in a coffee shop, or you could be with family or doing something else. But why are you here? Why have you come to be with the people of God and worship God together? Um, either... Either something really special happens here or we're all a little bit strange, (laughs) you know? Either something very special happens here or we're all a little bit odd. I actually believe it's the former. 
rather than the later. I actually believe that when we gather together, that something happens. Something happens to us, you know? Um, because what happens is this. If you can imagine, you, you know the phrase, I've got my finger in a lot of pies. Have you heard that phrase? I've, I've got my finger in a lot of pies. And sometimes in your life, you've got your finger in all these pies, all these things happening, and you're focusing on what's going on, you know? But when you come here, what happens is you take your finger out of the pies and you lift your hands to God, right? We literally do that. We, we take our fingers and we take our eyes off what is going on in our own lives outside of this place and we lift our attention to God. That's the difference. And when we lift our attention to God, this is the key. Something happens to us. Something happens to us. As we pray a prayer of confession to God, God does something to us. And we change. We change. We change. Because we're not turning... You notice that you get stuck in your own life, you get focused on something that's stuck in your life and you look at it and you look at it and it might be like a watch that's in my life and, and I'm looking at it and I'm looking at it and, and the closer it gets, the bigger it is and it takes up all my vision and I can't see anything else. Does that happen to you? Sometimes it does. But when we come here, we take our eyes off the pie, we take our eyes off the things that become so big in our lives and we reframe, we return back to God. We literally turn our attention away and back to God and something happens to us, we become transformed. Now, this message should not be new. I've been talking about this all year long because our theme for 2023 has been about becoming, hasn't it? was up there before, becoming the people that God intends us to be. We are changing all the time and the question we've been asking ourselves is, who are you becoming? What is happening to you? What kind of human being are you? And the, the thing is to say, God, we want to become what you want us to be. We want to become the people that you call us to be. We want to become the church that you call us to be. This is not a new message. But what do we do now? Because we're moving into a new year and we're going to get a new theme next year. It's not going to be becoming anymore. It's going to be, I'm not going to tell you what it is. It hasn't, not new year yet. But what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Where does that leave us as we think about stepping tonight at 12 p.m., stepping over the line, on the, we're on the cusp of newness, what does it mean for us? That's really what today's message is about. And I think this reading from the start of the letter to the Philippians actually gives us something that we can frame that movement with. Let me pray. Oh, loving Lord Jesus, we thank you that every step we take, you are with us. You have come into the world. You have revealed what God is like and Lord you are indeed the one true God we thank you that you have risen from the dead and Lord as we listen to these readings and step into them may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you Lord our strength and redeemer so this first chapter of Philippians written to the church in Philippi. Let's think about a bit of context for this reading. Um, Paul is writing this, but he's not writing it alone. It actually is a... Um, he starts off by saying, Paul and Timothy, slaves in Christ. Slaves. He says sometimes it's translated servant. Okay? And he, he's, he's got his protege with him. And Paul, when he writes this letter... He's under house arrest in Rome, okay? So he's writing it far away and he's sending the letter to the churches. And it's fair to say that the church that he's sending it to in Philippi is not just one church. 
it's a number of house churches around that particular region. So this letter is to be circulated among different Christian groups around the place. And uh, it's not... It's, it's, for the whole, it's for the whole church. It's for the church, the, the saints, and it's for the leaders. In verse 1, he says this, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus. Some translate, to all the saints, okay? Together with the overseers and deacons. So obviously there's a number of churches because there's more than one overseer and there's more than one deacon. Does that make sense? It's pretty straightforward. But it may even be that Paul intended the message to not only go to the churches around Philippi, but to advance beyond there as well. And if you read on in the book of Philippians, you can see that it's talking about the advancement or the the moving forward of the gospel, the good news about the coming of the kingdom of God. And that's what Paul's doing with this letter. Um, Philippi, by the way, is located on a, a long trade route called the Ignatian Way and, and it, it travels, it's a, it's a lot of merchants coming through. So when Paul planted that church, it was very strategic because the gospel message could easily be transferred through merchants travelling along the Ignatian Way which is about over 1,100 kilometres right from Albania in today's world, right through Greece all the way to Turkey which is a really, really long route. And there's another route that actually heads straight up to Rome. So that's how it's whole, which also feeds into this context of advancing the gospel from Philippi. That's just a bit of a side detour. So there's this idea of advancing the gospel. Let's pick it up from verses 3 to 6. This is what he says. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The first thing I notice here is that Paul seems to be invested in the people he's writing to it seems that you know this is more than just a a letter from a boss to a bunch of employees or something there's there's a personal thing going on here because he says that he prays for them every time he remembers them he, he prays for them now i don't know about you but i remember people it doesn't mean i pray for them all the time sometimes i'm praying and god brings people to remembrance sometimes it's some of you In fact, I try to pray for everyone. But, you know, um, Paul is invested. He's got a relationship with the people in these churches. He really cares for them. And it seems to me that it's an intimate relationship. But the way he describes it is a partnership in the gospel. Now, that word, partnership, it's actually not sufficient to explain the way Paul feels about them. In fact, if you read other translations of this letter, it'll use the word the sharing uh, of the gospel or, or the fellowship or, or um, the communion because there's no English word that fully captures the original Greek word, which is koinonia or koinonia, koinonia, koinonia. My Greek's terrible, koinonia. This Greek word koinonia, this partnership, this sharing, this fellowship, it, it, it means so much more in its original context. It means a communion and a sharing, it, a profound sharing of not only experiences, but a sharing of resources, of sharing life together, and a real sense of interconnectedness. This is the intimacy that Paul is talking about here an interconnectedness with the people, a partnership, a participation, um, an active involvement, a cooperation. You can see that it's hard to quantify with English words what koinonia really is, or koinonia, sorry. (laughs) It's unity, it's relationship, 
a deep sense of unity. And, and one way that I like to, well, someone once taught me, it's really about belonging to one another. You know, Paul belongs to these people and they belong to Paul in as much as you belong to one another. We are in a deep fellowship which is hard to express with the English language. And this is what Paul, the context that Paul is using to, to engage with the people. So he's talking about something very relational going on with the ones that he's writing to and he's deeply invested in them. And then he follows on with this. And it's about bringing the purposes of God into that context of koinonia, fellowship. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. That God is doing something to you. God is doing something to you. Have you stopped to think about what God is doing to you? Not for you, not just, Lord, answer my prayers and, Lord, I need this, please help me, God, I need this. God wants to help you, but God wants to do something to you. He wants to transform your life and change things for the better, which is rather amazing, amazing. Jesus is at the centre of, of what is being outworked in the process, in, in the life of these congregations in Philippi. And, and it comes about through not just being together, but doing together. It comes about through the advancing, of the proclaiming of the good news. It, it's one thing to know about Jesus, but it's another thing to actually live the way Jesus is calling us to live and to step into the, the process of sanctification, the process of change and transformation that God wants to do. Because the coming of the kingdom of heaven means a change for us if we're willing to allow God to do that work. So koinonia, koinonia a communion and sharing and partnership, participation, unity and relationship all of participation being involved in that does something to us. Now, you don't have to be here on New Year's Eve, but you're here, and I think it's for that reason. I'm not saying you shouldn't come, but this is why we come, isn't it? Ultimately, I'm trying to explain the very deep reason why we end up coming to church every Sunday if we do, which we should, right? Because something spiritual, as we gather in a koinonia fellowship relationship, something spiritual happens. Something spiritual happens. And it's something that's hard to quantify. But we keep coming back, don't we? Because we want to be in this participation. We want to become the people God is calling us to be because we know that when we actually step into the will of God we actually have the, the joy. We suddenly find ourselves in a place where, hey, things are making more sense. I'm not going the other way. I'm not moving away from God's will for my life. I'm actually stepping into where God wants me to be and lo and behold, life is actually okay. In fact, life is pretty good. Life is pretty good because I'm, I'm doing the things I was created to do. I've got these wonderful gifts and suddenly I'm using them. I've got these wonderful abilities and, and I'm able to bless people and they're thankful and they love me. Isn't that great? Where else are you going to find that in the world? Pretty hard to find, right? Because we're stepping in to the purpose of God. So what I'm saying about this is that you're here today. You might have thought, oh, I'll get up this morning. It's my choice. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to church and, you know... But can I reframe that and say, actually, God called you first. God called you here. You're here in response to the 
calling of the Spirit of God. It's not an accident. You're here because God wants to do something to you as you begin to think about stepping into the next year. A lot of people are off doing something else, you know. They're chasing money and power and fun and all these things. Many people grasping at straws to try and make them happy. And happiness, they, f- they get a straw. Hey, I've got this great straw. And, oh, all right, what's next? Oh, I've got to get another straw. You know, we, we've got to step into God's will because God has a plan. Last week I talked about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. You know, that God has created us uniquely to do good works so you know i'm not saying that you're going to be happy all the time if you step into the will of god but you're certainly going to find peace there's absolutely no doubt about it so all of this conversation feeds into this theme of becoming and as we step into next year there'll be a new theme but what do we do because you know, we're, we're constantly going to be thinking about who are we becoming. This, this becoming theme really doesn't stop even though we go into a new season. Um, the ultimate end of this becoming that we're finishing up on today is that we will be just like Jesus. The Scriptures tell us that. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. John says this, Dear friends... Now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and all who have hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So we will be just like Jesus, but in the meantime, God is doing something to us to conform us into the image of Christ. And Paul, in this reading from Philippians, gives us an indication of what we should be doing, how we should be living, and the things we should be aspiring to as we wait for the return of the Lord and as we continue to come together as God's people. And it's through his prayer, this beautiful prayer that he prays for the the people he loves, that he's deeply invested in. In this koinonia koinonia relationship, he says this, This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? You know, there's a lot going on in that prayer. And I, I'm going to just, before I finish up, just break that prayer down because I think it's not only a prayer for the churches in Philippi, but it's a, ch- it's a prayer for all the churches of all the generations right even to us today. This is something we can ask for and we can believe God is answering. First of all, He prays that your love may abound more and more. More and more love. Um, That that your love will grow. Grow abundantly. And, And love is more than just an emotion, you know. Love encompasses our actions and our concerns for others and what we do, how we treat other people. And Paul says that we should grow and abound in love more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That's pretty interesting. He's not saying just, oh yeah, get more love, right? No, get more love, but go deeper. Go deeper with God, go deeper with other people. And may your increase in love also be complemented by an increase in understanding of not only yourself, but others an increase in understanding of the world you live in and the very purpose for who you are, who you were created to be. This is the spiritual dimension that we're talking about here. That you would become a person who is informed, a person who's thoughtful in your love. 
And he says to do that so that you may be able to discern what is best. This is knowledge and insight that allows the people of God to be wise, to know what choices to make, to know how to make a good choice, discerning your distinct decisions and being able to distinguish between what is good and what is not. It's not always easy because many things are presented to us as good. But once you scratch the surface a little bit, you realise, hey, actually, I'm not sure about whether that's good. The Spirit of God can give us that gift of discerning what is good, excellent in, in the situations we find ourselves in. And he says this, and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. And he's talking about that moment that could come at any time, the return of the Lord. We've been talking about it through Advent leading up to Christmas, but it may not be the return of the Lord at any moment. At any moment, we can go before the throne of God. Any moment. It's not our choice. We can't choose it. It happens when God chooses. We need to be prepared. We've talked about that through Advent, that we might find ourselves pure and blameless Um, living a life of moral purity, I suppose you could call it, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Paul wants the people of God to bear good fruit. Paul wants the people of God, you, to bear good fruit, right? He says elsewhere, by their fruits, you will know them, it says there. So it's about what kind of things are happening. Do you see, do you see the, the manifestation of God's grace and goodness happening in your life? Are you experiencing the presence of God? Are you experiencing the power of God in the Holy Spirit? Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Filled with the fruit of righteousness, and we call them fruits, fruit of the spirit right to the glory and praise of god ultimately god ultimately paul is saying that all of this is not for us anyway all of this is to glorify god and every just about every time we start a church service here i'm saying god may we glorify you in what we are doing may we glorify you because When we are transformed by the Spirit of God, when we begin to participate, not only in the sharing of the gospel, the words of the gospel and the message of the gospel, but participate in the actual transformation that the gospel has on us, it's an inward participation and an external participation. When we allow that to happen, then we bring glory to God in our lives. It just happens. We don't have to try. We just do it. So, we're about to enter a new year. We're going to have a new theme and we're finishing this theme today. But my prayer is the same prayer that Paul prays. And may it be a prayer for me and for you. And I want to pray it over you now as we finish this year and we finish today. So, loving God. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, come. Touch your people today, Holy Spirit. Touch your people. Do something to your people today, Holy Spirit. Touch your people, Jesus. I pray for everyone who's a part of our church today, Father. Those who are here and those who are far away. Lord, you know them. You love them. And Father, I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you, church, may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God And in his holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you all.